Welcome, everybody. And um, I'm Dr. Professor Lopez, I'm the PI of this project. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at the University of Texas in El Paso. And I'm very pleased that you could join us. This is a collaborative effort uh, that involves multiple institutions, four year institutions and two year institutions. We started back in 2019. We had our first cohort of seven graduate students and finished just in time at the end of May. And we wanted to start another cohort. Uh, this time we wanted to do it in uh, at the University of Texas permanent basement. And then COVID hit. But ever since We've been doing it virtually. We actually had our largest cohort of students last year. It was a uh, virtual cohort. We didn't have the opportunity to get together. So we just absolutely failed that you're here, that we have our guest speaker here, that we have people doing uh, <laughs> the hybrid thing. Hello, Permit Mason. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so, Without further ado, I would like to pass the baton back to uh, Sara. So Thank you. Start the, the conversation. I hope you are very pleased at the end, as I said, that you're here and we're going to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Well, wonderful. Uh, following our webinar tradition today, this is our topic, which you all know from our calendar, finding the right community college. It's actually a two-in-one presentation. So how to find the right community college for you and also talk about community college faculty responsibilities. So what are the faculty roles and what does that entail? What are the ins and outs of getting employed? And once you're there, it's not only just getting into the class and teaching. So for that, we have our very special guest speaker and co-PI. This is our webinar outline. So you can see here the contents of the presentation. We do these just to facilitate the navigation once you download the PDF and you are specifically looking for something in our, in our um, documents, okay? So you can see that and keep it for your files. And we're gonna talk about um, the faculty responsibilities or key responsibilities, the components of teaching and certain or different faculty paths that you can take once you get a position at a community college. And of course, followed by a breakout session as always and some concluding remarks. So for today, our webinar facilitator and star co-PI is Dean Joshua Villalobos, who is joining us from El Paso Community College and it is Mission del Paso campus. So the one far out, depending on where you live, if you live, in the far east that's the closest one to you but for most of us that's the far epcc campus right so right now um dean villalobos is the community college uh, liaison for our alliance and that's the west texas research collaborative where the nsf includes aspire that you're all part of um previously Dean Villalobos was also a associate and associate professor of geology, and he received both his degrees from UTEP. So go miners, geological sciences. That's why we included a very professional picture showing both of his roles as instructor and as dean or um, academic administrator. So he was also the administrator for the Texas A&M University Agricultural Experiment Station in El Paso a facilitator for the National Association of Geoscience Teachers and up to now. And most recently he became the leader facilitator. Super interesting. I really like this, the America Geophysical Union's position statement on climate change and evolution. That's important. And also very, um, very notoriously, he received the Paesmem, which is also an award, Dr. Flores, Received, so we're very, very proud that we can say that. And this is a recognition from the White House. And it is the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. And of course, he has extensive experience as PI, Principal Investigator and Co-PI, a bunch of publications. And most recently, he has joined us as a Co-PI for the NSF Includes Aspire West Texas Research Collaborative. And with that said, all yours. I 
Do you, do you, so you can move around or do you want to do it? Yeah, I, I can do it that way. Yeah, right. thank you. Okay. Um, thank you everybody uh, for coming today. So I, I just got through a whole bunch of interviews this past week for faculty and I know how stuffy the presentations can be. So if you want to ask me questions during it, if you want to, you know, um, interrupt me, please do so and we'll kind of um, get some more information uh, that way. So, um, so starting off my uh, presentation, um, this was a slide that I recently saw uh, regarding this um, uh, statement that Beth Smith, and she was an academic senator, uh, pres uh, Senate president for um, community colleges of California. It's a very, very large community college system. And she really summed up what really a community college faculty member um, has on their plate on being at, at a community college where you know the community college faculty lands in that sweet spot where the focus is teaching and assistance of students. I think that's just a fundamental thing that all community colleges are looking for their instructors. Um, and it also has a responsibility to develop and propose solutions for curriculum, degree requirements, and other aspects of student learning. Community colleges rely very heavily on their faculty in these aspects because our teaching loads are so heavy. Um, so we're looking at, on average, most community college instructors um, teach anywhere from four to five on their base load. If they want additional classes, then they can um, add additional ones to it. Um, so it is very intensive in terms of teaching. Um, but also, there's other responsibilities and professional duties that come with the community college job. Um, that are also very important I'll talk about a little bit later. And so I think that the core of this statement is really that we are here to really improve the overall college experience for our students. Our students have a, an extremely broad background. Um, many of them are not traditional students. And so we want to make sure that this is their very first step into higher education. Um, we hope it's not their last step and that they continue either through their associates, certificates, or through their four year um, master's and PhD. So we want to make sure that with us being their first experience that we give them the best possible experience um, that we can collectively. So in terms of responsibilities, I, I think uh, I have colleagues from all over the United States, community colleges vary dramatically, not only from institution to institution, but also from state to state. Um, so, but there are several similarities that I typically try to um, point out. And I think these are some of the three key responsibilities that you're going to find in any position at any community college that um, you have the pleasure of teaching at. Um, obviously, first is going to be teaching. And so some of the things that an institution will look for when we're looking for somebody to teach at our community colleges, either as an adjunct or as a tenure track faculty member is can you evolve your pedagogy? Um, we all just came through COVID, right? Faculty had to turn on a dime um, in order to go from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And for us, that was particularly challenging because a lot of our students, you know, don't have high-speed internet. Um, a lot of our students have disabilities. So if you are, you know, blind or have um, hearing impairment, how are you going to translate that to online? So our faculty had to learn very quickly how to change their lectures and their courses to accommodate not only the online setting, but also to our students. Are you inclusive in your teaching? Um, and so we have a very high percentage of non-traditional students. And I'm not just talking about students with disabilities. We're talking about single parents, um, students who are over the age of 25, military, so that's a very broad spectrum of students that we have to ensure that the way that we teach is really covering all of their specific needs. And sometimes that seems overwhelming, but in actuality for me, that was the greatest part of my job was seeing that challenge and figuring out how am I gonna um, solve it. Uh, so this is a picture as an example of a faculty member that I evaluated a few weeks ago where <clears throat> It's a face-to-face -face class. Half the class is online um, via Teams. The other half is face-to-face. -face. Uh, she is also dealing with a student who is deaf. So she has to have a translator inside the class as well, and then make all of those components work. And this is a speech course, so that's a very difficult thing to do online. But the faculty did a wonderful job doing that. 
Um, and how up to date are you on your trends in your discipline? Some discipline trends um, occur very rapidly, like government, right? Or um, some fields of science. So you want to make sure that you know you are up to date in terms of what's really happening inside your field, and can you convey that um, to our students, right, at at the undergraduate level? So those are those are some of the key responsibilities in terms of teaching in the classroom that that we look for in community colleges. Now. If you do have the opportunity to get a position inside there, even as an adjunct, I'm always telling my adjuncts, um, participate within the community college. Look at some of the responsibilities that you can do as an adjunct, not only within the institution, but also within the discipline. So what that's gonna give you the opportunity to do is highlight or showcase, can you work well with others? So if you're an adjunct, and you're in those division meetings and they're looking for volunteers for textbook reviews, you know, that would be awesome to have uh, adjunct say, yeah, I'll help review a couple of textbooks. It's going to show them that you are willing to work not only um, with departmental stuff, but that you're going to be good working with each other inside the discipline. Um, can you follow through with tasks? So um, that's also going to show them that. And another institutional responsibility that we look for is that are you going to be willing to help students um, beyond the classroom? So are you going to be willing to stay a few minutes after class or um, hold your office hours so students can come and ask questions that they may be too embarrassed to ask in front of the class? So these are all, um, three of the things that we really look for in terms of institutional responsibilities. I would probably say this one right here is my personal one that I look for um, the most. Right there, are you willing to help our students um, outside of the classroom? And the one thing that every community college has in common is that we have the word community inside our names. Um, we have to be able to service our community. We have to be able to have that ability to not only improve the lives of our students, but actually improve our community as a whole. Um, so how are you going to be able to represent your institution? Um, is that through outside organizations? Is it through some type of mentoring program that you do? Um, these are the things that we're looking for. And also, how are you going to promote the college and the classes you teach? Uh, we just did a workshop last week for faculty on how to use uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, so these are things that most of our faculty not only don't participate in, but never heard of. Um, but this is a great way for us to reach out to these new students you know, who this, they like those little one minute videos and it's a great way to promote their programs. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of my kids. So we do a community program at my campus uh, where faculty come in, bring uh, school supplies for students who can't afford school supplies. Um, and so this is a completely faculty led initiative. So we go out there and they bring uh, all of the school supplies and then the students are selected by counselors at their individual schools for um, students who um, just simply uh, can afford certain supplies and they come over and they do scavenger hunts and they get to pick their stuff and they get to pick their own backpack, which is tremendous, right? Um, because most of these programs just give them a, program, uh, a backpack with stuff inside there, but here it's like going shopping. So we give them fake money and they can go and buy their stuff and it really empowers those students. And again, all faculty-led adjuncts and full-timers. Uh, full so any questions? All right. Okay, um, so in terms of responsibilities, so if you do get a position at the community college, again, either as an adjunct or um, hopefully as a tenure track faculty member, and not all uh, community colleges offer tenure, um, the ones that do, it's a very different process. I know our process is much, much different than the ones that I've talked to um, at other institutions. But these are some of the things that you might want to um, keep in mind in terms of what you're going to be looking at in terms of responsibilities outside of the teaching. So obviously, we're going to look at um, how, what's your pedagogy? How do you teach? Are you going to be flexible um, in teaching? your five classes with some face-to-face, -face, some hybrid, some online. We don't want to know that, no, I don't do online or I don't do face-to-face, -face, I do all online. You know, um, you want to make sure that you have the ability to 
teach in a variety of ways. Lab instruction. The majority of science community college instructors not only teach the lecture, but the lab. So they have to be very knowledgeable in terms of all of the lab experiments and how to you know, go through each one of those different labs for every, every week. And students really enjoy that. And so do the faculty because faculty can then use that lab time to kind of cover stuff that they didn't get to in lecture. And then the students also like that because then they know exactly what needs to be done in the lab because the teacher's there with them. So that's something that is um, fairly unique um, at the community colleges and almost all instructors are required to teach the lecture and the lab. And the grading, which they don't want to um, So also we put a lot of emphasis in terms of our faculty having control um, of the schedule, um, uh, reading and reporting. So for us, um, our faculty can love, uh, rise up to a level of a coordinator, um, which might run for one or two years. And they're the ones that are scheduling how many face-to-face, -face, how many online, who gets what classes, and things like that. Our faculty are also in charge of reporting. So our student learning outcomes, they also have to track um, for instance, uh, surveys. So our campus surveys to let us know how we're doing, not only in the classrooms, but at the institution as well. So again, that's uh, another load that faculty have to carry um, at the community college system. A curriculum revision. This is a very heavy lift, but I can tell you that one of our most popular committees that faculty want to serve on is our um, curriculum committee. Uh, the curriculum committee allows faculty to look at the curriculum, see what needs to be adjusted, what needs to be removed, how do we update the syllabus and things like that. Um, in the state of Texas, um, we have to adhere to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. They are the ones that dictate what classes a community college can teach. Um, and so that sometimes does put us in a little unique situation where we're not allowed to kind of offer classes that we would like. So as a geology instructor, I would have loved to have offered a geology of all passive class for my geology major. But since that is not inside the course guideline manual through the higher education coordinating board, we're not allowed to teach that. So this curriculum committee allows our faculty to kind of tweak what is inside that guideline book to see how we can really um, inspire our students to do research, how to study things that may not um, fit in a particular class, we can kind of modify that. So that's something that they really enjoy. Uh, department duties and roles. Um, so uh, you can get elevated to a department chair in some community colleges at EPCC. You can get elevated, like in my case, to a dean. Um, and so there's also coordinator and district-wide coordinators. So there's a wide variety of, of different levels a community college full-time instructor can actually rise into to kind of help not only the discipline, but the institution. Um, we're also looking for professional development requirements. And so one of the great things about the community colleges is that a lot of um, people don't realize that the community colleges still allow you to do a lot of professional growth. So, um, when I was all in your chairs here at UTEP, I had no idea what the community college had to offer other than a part-time job. It wasn't until I started to get my hands into the system that I realized research is a possibility, writing is a possibility, being able to serve on committees and NSF um, reviews. I mean, those are things that I didn't think were possible for community college instructors, but they're there. So there's still that tremendous amount of personal and professional growth that you can still uh, achieve while teaching at a community college. Now, like I stated, not all community colleges will have a tenure path. Um, it's, and if they do, it's somewhat different. Um, we have a system that is at El Paso Community College. You go through five years, um, you have to submit a binder of all the stuff that you've done for five years. It goes to a committee. They it. There's a third year progress report. 
it's very intense. Um, and our success rate is somewhere around 80%. Um, other institutions, it's simply you've served your five, six years, you're automatically granted. So it really varies. So in your search for community colleges, you want to know if tenure is offered or what are some of the benefits becoming a full-timer um, that they offer. So typically this is the path most community colleges have. Um, you'll have an adjunct where it's, you're teaching part-time. Um, typically you'll get to teach between um, one and two classes depending on if it's a four credit or a three credit from El Paso Community College. Other places like California, you have uh, part-timers who can teach like eight classes a semester. They're highway teachers. They just go from community college to community college, um, taking up all of those classes. Um, but it's typically with an adjunct. Then with an adjunct, you can become a lecturer. Lectures usually last for one, two years. Um, and then that position is then opened up into a tenure track position or assistant professor. And then once you've done tenure, you spend a few years and then your title changes to associate, to full, and so on and so forth. But these are kind of the, the three main ones everyone's looking at is the adjunct lecture and assistant. Now, sometimes an adjunct can simply just jump the lecture and go straight to a, a tenure track position. Um, so like what we were doing this week, interviewed a lot of adjuncts. Um, some of them bypass that lecture and are now going to be offered the, the tenure track positions. Well, was there a comment on the curriculum revision bullet? Mm -hmm. I think it's important also to mention that that is where academic freedom falls for community college faculty. Because as you mentioned, um, community colleges are subject to the state's regulations and what can they teach and what can they offer. But also that's based on the curriculum or the core classes. Correct. But also the department can get together and say, we want to offer a class in geology of El Paso. And if your committee approves it, it can be done, but it won't count towards a degree that's recognized by the state. But there is some wiggle room of academic freedom where elective courses are more and more often offered through community colleges that not necessarily transfer, but they increase the presence of a department. And it's also important to mention that this is um, different from state to state. Very true. It is different from state to state. The state of Texas did um, make that tighter for us to be able to use elective to create classes that we wanted to teach. So that option was now removed from us. And now we stick to the TCC and the Texas the common, common course, course correct. So if some of you went to EPCC, you may notice, hey, how come my geology class is labeled this at EPCC, but at UTEP it's this. We used to follow two different ones. Now we're universal within the state of Texas, so there's no more problems with that. So um, yeah, so that's a great one. Yes. So is community college following Texas or Common Core, or is it a hybrid of the two? Um, so we follow Common Core, which comes out of the, the Texas Higher Education okay. Coordinating Board. So they pretty much dictate um, universities have a lot more flexibility in terms of what they can offer and whatnot. Uh -huh. Community colleges are, are pretty strict in terms of courses, but not what you can teach in them. So it's a nice outline, and then you're free to paint whatever you want inside that portrait. Uh, so. No, because um, I work all, I'm currently working with the Common Core okay. in New Mexico. In New so Mexico, in okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, the, the core that we have is through the Texas Higher Education Coordinator Board, which is different than New Mexico's. So. I thought about that because you mentioned California. So California has a whole different approach. For it's another world for community colleges in California. So how do you find that right community college for you? It may be local, it may be out of state. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of community colleges out there. So um, as of 2021, there's 1,167 of community colleges um, out there. One of the things that I wanted to point out 
is that they may not all have the, the name community college inside their title. Sometimes they're junior colleges, sometimes they're city colleges, technical schools, two-year colleges, um, tribal colleges. So there's a lot of different terms that when you do your searches um, that may go beyond the title of a community college. Uh, some community colleges don't like that term. And so they just say um, like El Paso College or something like that. Uh, so now in terms of what types of degrees they can offer, uh, associates is pretty typical. Um, as well as certificates and licenses. And so that's something else the faculty really enjoys, especially within disciplines, um, seeing where they can offer certificates and license for people, like say for geology, if you want your state license, well, you can maybe even offer that through El Paso Community College. Um, some community colleges are now starting to offer bachelor's degrees. And so that's something that is coming down the pipeline uh, it's not too common, but we're starting to see a lot more of them beginning to do that. Um, we also are starting to see a lot of universities um, either absorbing community colleges as part of their systems or community colleges or universities splitting into a, a, a community college component and their university component. So that's also a trend that's been happening uh, recently. So when you're looking for that right community college, you wanna make sure that you're um, casting that net pretty wide and not just focusing on Googling community colleges, but other terms as well. Um, you also wanna see what types of degrees are offering, what type of environment is that community college in? Um, and you also wanna see uh, how are they in terms of their education? What do they do in terms of research? How are they, uh, how do they let their faculty publish? and what ways that you can get engaged in your field at that particular community college. Um, I know for me, it was a huge relief once I learned that I can write NSF grants and that we had a, a phenomenal grants office that actually just sat down with me and we, all four of us just wrote the grant together for my very first NSF grant was the very first grant I ever got. I mean, it was a phenomenal grant department that I give all credit to. Um, and a lot of community colleges that I'm finding have phenomenal grant writing offices that do participate in things like that. So, um, so for the, the breakout session, um, I wanted to kind of let you all think about what I just talked about and what type of community college would you be thinking about, um, you know, teaching at where are some of the things that you really want to focus on? Is it teaching? Is it research? Is it you know, student support. So these are some of the things that I think um, you might want to start to kind of get in your head right now as you begin that process of maybe looking into um, spending some time at a community college. Because I can tell you that when I was in your chair and I was, I never put community college anywhere on my career path when I was at the university, never. If you told the graduate student me that I would be at a community college, I would have taken a long walk on a short pier, uh, considering all the work that I went through. Um, it wasn't until I got into the community college that I realized how amazing it is. The students, the support, the institution, that after my first semester, I completely changed my mind and I'm no longer going to industry. I'm not going to really focus on this. And it was a dramatic change for me. Um, and I'm hoping you all kind of see that as well. Great. So um, if we can talk a little bit about what's going to be exciting for you in your career as a potential community college instructor or in higher education. Yep. Sorry. Um, I think I really enjoyed your um, post about being able to receive grant funding still, I think that really wasn't in my mind in terms of community colleges, like what is the limit to grant funding, what do you expect to grant funding even out there, is there, um, and the fact that that perception is really um, affecting your thinking on how to obtain an award, so really not with um, I think NSF space and having that mechanism available at community colleges, they can, they have a broader impact and they, you know, so focused education resources, I think having that mechanism that can be especially really valuable. So I agree with you. Um, I'm kind of like a biomedical researcher, PhD candidate, so I never thought of community college. Yeah, I'm 
like, like Dr. Boskis, right? Exciting to me about the entire institution. Yeah, it, it was exciting for me as well. Um, and so um, one point that I would mention is that if you do have the opportunity to get into an interview and that is exciting for you, um, that may not be something that you want to completely like say, hey, I want to do research because we really want to focus on um, education. But if you want to do research to support education, that is phenomenal. And so we have grants, you know, my grants were relatively small to compare to Dr. Rafolis's, um, where, you know, they may have been 200, 300,000. Um, but at a community project, that's well, not small. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> definitely not the six digit ones that I see coming out of UTEP and some of my colleagues. Uh, but you can do just so much work at a community college in terms of research. I know when I uh, was asked to serve on an NSF panel, I got there and I was like, oh, I, I think they made a mistake. I don't think they know I work at a community college. And I was so afraid to mention that um, until they introduced me as working at a community college. But, and that's what they're looking for, right? They're looking for that diversity. Yeah. So. I'd like to add on to what you just said. I thought that was very interesting about the research opportunities. Thought that that was something offered at the community college. Uh, if someone does uh, have an interest in research since we're on this topic, is it uh, is it something that the community college tries to like be, be very specific with? Is it research and education? I'm an engineer by trade and background. Uh, would there be engineering research or would it be education research? It could be education research with a focus on education. So you can bring in research in order to help your students understand certain concepts um, and get them prepared for the field. So it wouldn't be a direct, I'm gonna spend 50% of my time trying to solve this particular problem and then the other half of my time I'll be teaching. There has to be a way where your research can support both teaching um, and the research itself. Okay, thanks. What I would like to propose is that we can continue the conversation this way if everything is okay with it. So if you have any additional questions for Professor Villalobos, we're going to do that. And we can also invite those in the uh, Permian Basin area to text us their questions. That way we can continue the conversation because I think it's very productive. One thing I wanted to add is that, you know, whatever you're thinking, if you're thinking about research, Think, in the con think about research in which you involve students. Mm -hmm. That's really key. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, I can tell you uh, big faux pas in interviews is somebody coming straight out of the PhD program wanting to inter uh, get a tenure track and they spend an, you know, their full 40 minutes of questions explaining their research. It might be fantastic research, but, you know, is it going to involve students? Is it going to support the students in trying to understand your field or maybe get their foot in the door in your field? Um, because remember, a lot of the students that come to community colleges do not have that opportunity that many of the undergraduates here at the university have to work in a lab um, or to, you know, even see some of the equipment that you have here. So for me, most of my research were kind of simple black project, but I would call black box project geophysical experiments, right? So the, the, the students would use the geophysical equipment, record the numbers. They didn't necessarily understand the theories on how that machine worked per se, but they were able to digest the data, come up with hypotheses, um, test them out in the field with the equipment. So it really got their feet wet in terms of what they would be doing when they transferred to the four-year um, institution. And another thing to keep in mind is that if you do do research, another strong component is collaborations um, with uh, your fellow four-year institutions around that community college. So the relationship you have with UTEP, you know, all of that equipment, I, never, I didn't buy it, that would be all my grant money. So we had the collaboration with UTEP to, if we can borrow their equipment for our students. And that really engaged our students, not only to use the equipment, but also to meet the professors that they will potentially be having if they made the transfer. 
So it's those types of things that you can start to bring into your research when you're explaining what you want to do at the community college for research. That's just going to level that up to what you really want to hear. Okay, so here I just we have uh, whenever we're doing research, we have to go through an IRB mm -hmm. form review. Is there a similar committee at community college level that would ensure ethical practices and yes, sir. safety of the purpose? Yes, yeah, so we have an, R, an IRB panel. So if your project does have to, if it does involve um, students or questionnaires or anything like that, experiments involving students, mm -hmm. that has to go through an IRB. And usually cutting with a structure will allow you um, for a grants office or a, a sponsored projects office that will guide you through those steps and mm -hmm. make sure that you have what the funding agency requires you to have so they release your funding and you can pay for it. Okay. Yeah, so it's not something you can automatically, right. you'll automatically need to know they'll, they'll be able to guide you through that. And there's a broad spectrum that you need to consider uh, institutions. So, as community college has an IRB, they have been involved in uh, getting grants for a considerable number of years. There's the trajectory. Other community colleges may not have that option. Okay. So it's very important if you're thinking about that, you ask these questions. I'm interested in doing research. Is that a possibility? Is that one of the priorities? And probably if you do your homework, you don't have to ask that question, but then you can start probing a little bit deeper. It's very important that you care and know the institution and its mission. Mm -hmm. If you understand their mission, then you're probably going to get bonus money for doing that. And then if you can contextualize what it is that you're trying to do with your research, that helps out tremendously. Another thing I would just like to add is that there's many opportunities for you to participate in British to the baccalaureate programs where you're at the community college, you're working with students, and you're telling them if you're really interested in something beyond your certificate or your associate's degree, you should participate in this summer program. We'll get you together with a professor at a university, you may get to visit them, do some research with them, and make that safe transition to the university. But I always tell the students, you need to get your associate's degree. You need to get your certificate. That's very important. And then think also about the transition. You can do all these things at the same time. Yeah, very, very true. Um, like I, I kind of stress, our students are non-traditional. Um, and so that transition from a community college to a four-year is significantly harder for many of our students. And so um, I know that I always push the associate's degree because you never know what's going to happen um, when you do make the transfer. You know, your parents get sick and you've got to go back to work. You know, now you've spent three years, but you still just have your high school diploma to show for it. If you have your associates, at least that associates in your back pocket um, for you to do something. And so yeah, I'm, I'm always stressing certificates and associates for students, and it really wasn't that that case before. It was like, okay, you got enough classes, now jump over to you. Um, now we're really making sure our students have something in their back pocket before they before they leave. And that's why it's the best place to start and, and finish. finish. <laughs> that's why we added and finish. <laughs> Anybody else more excited about having a career? We had a couple of prompts, but I'm sure you guys can handle the question. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with higher education. I'm a student here at UCM, but I don't really understand the differences between different institutions. And, uh, you know, I hear advertisements on the radio and on television about other schools. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between that is a that is a fantastic question. Um, so when we hear advertisements for Western Tech, Southwest University, Pima, those are for well, um, Park, uh, yeah, Park is. Those are for-profit institutions, um, and so they are not under accreditation. So that means that if a student goes to Southwest University and they want to be a phlebotomist. Um, they can go to Southwest University at four times the cost. 
So for $14,000, they can get their phlebotomy degree at Southwest University. But if they decide that they run out of money or they don't finish, those courses that they took at Southwest University transfer no else because it's not an accredited university. Same thing with the University of Phoenix. They're not going to transfer to UTEP. They won't transfer to the degree will, but not the, not the course will. Um, and so those students are now left with that student loan and no transferable classes. When they could have gotten a phlebotomy degree at El Paso Community College for $3,000. So um, we, we don't look too <laughs> kindly on, on for profits because they really are predatory. Um, it, it's extraordinary how much they charge the students. And you'll see that they have a success rate. We have a 100% success rate of our students finding jobs, just not in the fields. So yeah, he got a job and he's not working at Walmart. Um, they count that as a success because he's now employed, um, but not within the field that they get their, their degrees in. Um, so that's something that we constantly stress to our students, especially those first time in college, because those commercials are awesome. They are really catchy. They are really good and they're hard to compete with. Um, so yeah, you, that's a great um, question. Can you just clarify what you mean when you say accreditation? Because not everybody may be familiar yeah. with what that entails? So every university and college, um, they have to be accredited by some agency. Uh, we get accredited through SACS, which is the Southern Associations of Community Colleges. Oh, it's, it's and South. South. It's South, yeah. So, and I think that UTEP is also under SACS as well. So it's like this huge swath of the Southern United States um, has this agency that they come in every five years and with a fine tooth comb, they go through everything. Faculty credentials, grades, syllabi, interview students, interview faculty, to see is that institution hitting its benchmarks in terms of education? And if you're not, then you can be put on suspension, probation, all these ramifications, or have your accreditation revoked. If it is revoked, that means that none of those courses taught at that institution are transferable anywhere else. So it is a big deal whenever SACS comes in um, every five years for us. Uh, I'm sure for UTIP, it's also a major thing. Some, I know Texas Tech, you know, they also had some issues with SACS uh, a few years ago. Um, so that's something that uh, we take very seriously. Any institution takes very seriously. Thank you. And I said that uh, following your question, Angel, just because the for profits are not are accredited. Not accredited. So, so they that means, don't, yeah. yeah, there's no quality. Control. There's no quality control. So who's teaching the class? What are they teaching? What are the grades? What's the success for students? I mean, are they getting placed within the jobs that they are in? That's what we have to show. If you're a biology major, you're in a field, your, your job is in biology. Um, for profits that are non accredited, they don't need to show that so they can say whatever they want without losing anything. That's interesting. I think there's a message on the chat. Oh, let me see. Uh, Reagan, can you read up there? Oh, there. Um, is a is accreditation also degree specific? I hear the news. I, I can. I have heard I that those that. degrees have to get some kind of accreditation mm -hmm. also. Good. Thanks, Reagan. Good question, Reagan. And the answer is it depends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. But for example, in, in engineering. In engineering or in chemistry, you definitely have to be accredited by the uh, an accreditation board, which is separate from the federally approved organizations like SACS that we talked about. Okay, just think about every university, community college that is for nonprofit that is that receives its funding from the state or from the community. More likely than not, they're accredited. 
And when they're accredited, that means that the U.S. Department of Education has a sample of who was a, you meet certain criteria. We have had an organization go check with you, like Professor Villalobos said, and this, this makes a difference, right? In some disciplines, we we'll get programs to be accredited as well. And in some colleges, it's the college that gets accredited. So that, for example, the College of Business at UTEP gets accredited. Not the individual program, those are accredited through the institution, which is accredited. So there's a lot of work there. I mean, if you wanted to work as a, in a, an accrediting agency, you could probably do that. You know, you could get your degree and say, oh, well, I'd like to pursue this in higher education. There's plenty of opportunities there as well. But what you kind of keep in mind is that when an institution says that they're accredited, it's what they're really saying is that they have been certified by the U.S. Department of Education through this particular agency or organization, and we have met some quality control criteria. The same thing for engineers. We have an accreditation agency. We call that AVID, and they come and visit us every six years. And man, are we busy those two years prior to the visit because we want to make sure that all our T's are crossed and all our forms, all of the I's are done. Some programs are not accredited, okay? but if the institution is accredited, there's a quality control. Mm -hmm. So, like nursing is a good example that gets accredited by an outside agency, emergency medical technicians, just to make sure that what they're teaching satisfies hospital requirements or that particular um, field's requirements that SACS wouldn't necessarily be able to speak to. Um, so yeah, so there are some degrees that do require specialized accreditation. Very good question. Thanks, Regan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about the, the tenure path, and I'm interested uh, to know because say if you wanted a faculty position at a university, I think uh, one of the goals is to go up the chain, right? And I think that means uh, achieving tenure. Um, so I'm wondering, um, usually it's at the university level to get a mini releases of teaching mode and maybe some mm -hmm. research. Uh, I'm wondering what the benefit is at the, at the community college level. And I'm also wondering about the distribution. So, for example, um, I know that in nationally universities, there's more of a shift towards non tenure track. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if uh, it's the same at the community college level. Is it like more adjuncts than the tenures or, or you know, how the distribution is? Yeah, so um, I'll speak a little bit about that in terms of El Paso Community College um, for part-time and full-time. Um, so we, we have our own standard where um, we want to ensure that roughly 60% of faculty within the discipline are full-time. Um, and so whenever that ratio starts to get a little bit low, um, we will start to reevaluate, okay, let's start Let's do some more hiring. Um, let's go ahead and bring in some people, so that way it's it's not 50-50, um, and we have more full-time faculty for all the reasons I mentioned um, to to help the institution to help our students. In terms of the benefit for community colleges, um, I think it's number one is job security. Um, you have a, a flat salary, you have a contract salary now, um, you don't have to worry about a, a limited number of courses you can teach. Um, you get an office. Uh, so that's, that, that's usually um, a selling point for a lot of our faculty. But, you know, um, at the end of the day, I've always told my faculty, you know, tenure is kind of a pin to put inside your professional jacket. It's, it's a meter stick to show you this is how well I should be teaching for the rest of my career based on your packet. Um, it doesn't mean that you have a job for life, right? Uh, someone can still get fired. This just means it's just more paperwork <laughs> um, than if you're not tenured. Um, 
so at the community college level, it, it's more of a symbol of, yeah, you're, you've shown your value to the institution um, that, that anything else really. And I think that's pretty much the sentiment that I've heard from my other colleagues um, who have tenured across the, the US and community colleges. There's really no professional benefit. Like you don't say, well, now I can get more research done or, or whatnot. There's less that you have to do in terms of um, commitment work because usually when you're on a tenure track, you can't say no to anything. Um, so they just, all this committee work and everything to fill up that binder. So if you get tenure, it's like the first time you get to say no to them. Um, we're, we're hoping you don't say no all the time, but yeah, that, that's pretty much um, what we're telling you. Yeah, I have a story about a, a professor. This goes back to the issue of having an office and what a great motivator that can be. It is. I had a, a colleague uh, that works at New York City College Tech, and at one point in time, he told me, you know, man, I'm really disappointed in my institution. I have to share my office with four professors. I said, well, who's got the nicest office? Well, there are no more the president's office. Just got to move on. <laughs> but now he's provost at the university. And he's, well, he's, he sends me pictures of his office. <laughs> <laughs> like, great advice. <laughs> yeah, but it really is, uh, you know, it, it shows the institution uh, what you're capable of doing and the, 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 the discipline what you're capable of doing. And um, for us, like I said, it's about being present successfully. Um, and I think that's how we have such a phenomenal group of teachers because of professors, because you know we, we are very you know strict in terms of what we want. We want to make sure you're going to be there for the students and you are flexible with your pedagogy and you do know how to do active learning. Um, one of the things that many of us really don't realize is that at the community college, we get a lot of students straight out of high school. Some of them weren't even planning to go to, to college. And in today's K through 12 school system, if you go and evaluate a teacher, I can guarantee you it is nothing like when you were in fifth grade or third grade or second grade. It is all active learning. And you have students who have been going through 12, 13 years of active learning pedagogy and for you to put them into a college classroom for the first time, where the instructor is going to sit there for two and a half hours and lecture straight, they're going to be completely lost. So there's huge value in being able to learn that way when you get to the university of, of a classroom of four or 500 students inside there. So the community college offers this ability for us to fold in active learning to prep students to get ready for those true university courses where active learning just isn't possible. Um, and so that's where I think we have this huge potential to really get students prepped to enter the university system and really learn how to um, build college level courses. Your uh, level of success in the United States is university or is it so, yeah, that, that's another great question. So the way that we measure success at community college, and, and there's a lot of ways to measure success um, for a student. You know, did they um, go from one semester to the next semester? Did they go from fall to fall, so a full year? Is it through graduation? Is it through grades? Is it qualitative? Is it quantitative data? Um, so what we've been focusing on for the past couple of years, and most community colleges are now focusing on, is, is um, degree completion, so associate's degrees. Um, and then luckily, us having UTEP here and our students have this ease to transfer, we can now track our students here. Well, how successful are students here um, for transfer? So, but our degree completion is our number one um, metric right now for its success. I think it's good to be uh, transparent. I I have a full time job uh, and then I took the school year at UTEP. Thanks be to God, I'm graduating next semester. So, cool. Masters. Nice. Oh, great. It's a good yeah. feeling, right? Yeah, that's yeah. hard. That's, that's exciting. exciting. Uh, but, you know, I saw this email about this fellowship. I was asking people. 
interested in teaching at a community college. And it caught my attention, right? Uh, but I'll be very honest with, with my work, though. Uh, I don't know if it would be possible to teach five or six classes. Is the university open to someone that knows they ever want to teach? Sure, right. You can be a part timer. The vast majority of our part timers are people with full time jobs who, who teach in the at night or on weekends or whenever their job allows them to teach. Now, if it was a tenure track position, you you would have you wouldn't be able to have two positions. It would either be us or or not at all. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yeah, but I, I think you would still bring tremendous value as a part timer because being inside the field that you would be teaching, you would be having your students. Hey, this is I have this job, this engineering job or teaching engineering. This is what you can expect, and it, that has tremendous value. Um, for, for us at the institution, it's just not as a full timer. Part timers can also be extraordinarily influential for our student success. So don't don't give up the community college just because you have a full time job. Use that experience to to teach kids. Hey, this is the theory. Let me tell you what it is like in the real world. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, thank you. And like you say, you're citing transparency or honesty. I don't know what word you use. Uh -huh. But um, the percentage of adjuncts or part-time faculty at community colleges is immense. So you would be very, I guess, uh, identified with other members of the faculty yeah. that are in the same situation. Yeah. I can speak from my own experience because I started at EPCC part-time and then I went full-time because I was part-time there and part-time as a victim of the victim watch. And then part-time at Utah. So, uh, been there done that in that sense sometimes you transfer full-time into an institution you go into a full-time position you go into a tenure track or you stay in industry but you teach one or two courses online or on a weekend or at night i mean flexibility to consider that okay. yeah you, you know we have we have a standard of 60 percent needs to be for our, our full-time ratios but there's institutions where it's 70 percent part-time there's 30 percent full-timers um, and that's just standard. And I think that's probably the standard across the US where they are extraordinarily adjunct heavy. So, because especially in, in the places like California, um, Central Texas, where there's so many community colleges, it, you probably make just as much money as a part timer than as a full timer because you can go from community college system to community college system. So, two classes here, two, 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 as opposed to your all six and just one as a full time. So, you know, some people really make it work being a uh, part time faculty. Well, guys, respecting everybody's time, if you want to hang around, we have the room for another 30 minutes or so. But I know that we normally schedule a one hour session, and you probably have things and places to be and things to do. So, you feel free that we can wrap it up. And, um, Dr. Flores, if you want to make a few uh, uh, journeying remarks, but feel free to hang around we can continue the conversation we're just trying to be respectful of the time that we schedule right well, we have a formality of course we have uh, our guests from uh, the Permian basin area okay, which we for thank you reagan and dr montes who's right. listening and we want to make sure that all these thank you bye so pleased oh she said thank great. you Yes, I've heard that. Okay. And we are looking forward to at least two more events. If that's correct, maybe three. We uh, have three more. Three more. Three more. And I think that was for the close of the ceremony. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody here. And of course, this is your opportunity to stick around and ask additional questions to Professor Ria Lowell, who's a wealth of information, as you will know. He is a stellar model of how to be successful in a community college. So let's take a back. Thank you so much. And we'll be in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thank you. Oh, I had one thing to say. Uh, just one thing. I think you guys have already seen it. But last week, I sent out an email with like a lot of links, which also includes links to the Texas Higher Education Board and everything. So a lot of things with 
it has to be on almost Saturday. You can check out and then even I know he mentioned things about uh, like podcasts or like with Instagram videos. I even shared a link which is like community college minutes where it's just so you can find a lot of stuff, especially like questions about the Texas higher education board and etc. I said a link and you can just look up a lot of resources, you know, just so that there's more idea about my questions or I even shared the link for our website which has links to like community college job portals for our for texas california iowa and everything so you can go and check out specifically and there are like direct links to that and get a better idea of what's open and you know thanks adney